My name is Turan Bali. I am a professor of finance at Georgetown, and um, I am delighted to introduce uh, our keynote speaker, Deborah Fur, uh, managing partner and co-founder of ETFGI. Deborah has a long CV. I'll point out only a few items in interest of time. Um, previously, before ETFGI, uh, she worked as a managing director at uh, BlackRock, uh, Morgan Stanley, and Barclays Capital. Uh, she is the recipient of William Sharp Lifetime Achievement Award for outstanding contributions to the field of indexed investing, and um, she's been named as one of the most influential women in finance by Financial News, uh, not just once, a number of times between 2007 and 2014. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite to the podium Deborah Fur. Thank you for that kind introduction, which I missed, but I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, my name is Debbie Furr, um, and I've been covering the ETF industry since 1997. So I started covering ETFs. I've been in London for 21 years, although you can tell from my accent that's not my original home. Um, and so I've covered ETFs since there were 21 products and $8 billion. And regulations have very much driven the evolution of the products the trading, where ETFs are, and also who and why people use them. Um, if we could go to the first slide, please. Um, so what we've seen, I'm gonna talk a little bit and then kind of support some of the things I'm saying. So in the early days, when I started talking about ETFs, I was at Morgan Stanley. There were products that allowed you to get exposure to the US. Morgan Stanley actually helped to create what today are iShares, but they were called webs. So the MSCI business with the trading business where I sat, came together, came up with this idea because we had a product called Opals. And so the early web still exists today, and they give you exposure to Korea, Taiwan, Japan, 17 different MSCI countries. We ended up going to Barclays Global Investors because Morgan Stanley Investment Management said they wanted to stay active. In 1999, BGI decided to launch a whole family of products, and those products became iShares. But when I started, why did people use ETFs? A lot of them were using them because in 1934, the SEC put on what was called the uptick rule. So when people wanted to go short, the last price had to be ticking up. ETFs here in the US had an exemption to the uptick rule. So many people would use ETFs to go both long and short, and they also allowed you to get exposure to markets that were often difficult to invest in directly without having a foreign bank account or a quota. And so what you found was many people were using ETFs as really a trading vehicle. And so what we then saw was the ETF became kind of a portfolio management tool as many investors wanted to invest in markets where, especially for Japan, many people don't normally put money there because the best call often had to be not be invested there. So when they wanted exposure, they started to use ETFs. And then the next phase of what we've seen is ETFs have really become an investment product. And the reason that is true is this is looking at data that, and I have a few slides. What this shows you is what is the performance of active funds been against their relevant benchmarks on a one year, three year, and five year basis? And if you look at the US, it says that in 2015, 66% of large cap active funds in the US underperformed the S&P. If you were actually to look at the data they just published that looked at June to June, you would see that 86% of large cap managers in the US underperformed the S&P. And that would have been very similar to what we saw for the year of 2014. So what you find is it's very difficult to find active funds that consistently deliver alpha. And many investors around the world, as they move away from being in their home country to looking at investing in other markets, have found that using index products have been a useful thing to do. So ETFs are not an asset class. They are a product, but they really are a wrapper. They're a way to wrap exposure. They're a collective investment scheme, and I think that's really important when you think about what are they. And so when people think about using them, I think what they think about is, where can I capture alpha myself? And where I can't, I look for low cost beta. So we talk about this kind of barbell approach to investing. And if we could go to the next slide, what I started to do is to look at the evolution of assets and products and ETFs and contrast it to the hedge fund industry. So the ETF industry was not really started here. 
The first listed ETF that actually still exists today was started in Canada on March 9, 1990. So you heard earlier Dave talk about the SPY spider ETF on the S&P 500. That started in January 1993. So Canada was ahead by three years. So the ETF industry is 26 years old, and the hedge fund industry is 67 years old. And I'm using HFR data because they capture the largest number of hedge funds, and they also calculate in the very top there what has been the asset-weighted return of hedge funds on average. And so you can look at the past five years, and you can look at Q1 and Q2 and see that on average, hedge funds also are not beating the S&P 500. So you're paying often 2 and 20, as you would know, limited liquidity, limited transparency, and yet, even with all the freedoms they have to go long and short, um, they're not beating the S&P 500 on average. And so what we've seen is, last year at this time, the ETF industry became slightly larger. Their data comes out quarterly kind of a bit behind. So I'm looking right there at, right now at the end of Q2 this year, the ETF industry is $279 billion larger in assets than the hedge fund industry globally. But there's about 2,000 more products that are hedge funds than ETFs. So I think it is quite interesting to watch big time difference, 26 years versus 67. If we could go to the next slide. So here, maybe I should pull this back a little, sorry. Um, what I thought I would do is, so Canada was first, but when we look at where are the assets, what we do see is the US, this is looking at where are the assets and number of products, the US accounts for about 71% of all the assets. And right now, the level of assets in the ETF industry in the US is at a record level of about 2.4 trillion. If you look at Europe, we're also at a record, it's about 16%. We look at Japan, and Japan has been benefiting because the Bank of Japan for their quantitative easing has been buying ETFs. And so that really has been driving a lot of assets going into the Japanese market. It used to be that Japan, in terms of assets, which is now 191 billion, was smaller than the rest of Asia Pacific X Japan. The Asian region is very fragmented. It's impossible to list a locally domiciled product in Hong Kong and passport it to, to other countries. So you find that there's very local products in each one of the countries. And Japan, on its own now, is bigger than the rest of Asia Pacific, Pacific excuse me, which is 13 different countries. If we look at Canada, it's only 2.4%. Um, but it has been growing very quickly this year. It's one of the fastest growing just behind Japan, basically because many new issuers have gone into the market and we've seen a very significant increase in non-transparent, active, or semi-transparent. So when we talk about what's happening, semi-transparent or non-transparent basically means that ETFs would be following the same level of disclosure as mutual funds. So instead of daily, which is required today, for any product in the US based on SEC rules. In Canada, ETFs follow the mutual fund guidelines, which basically allow you to provide quarterly transparency. They even allow you to provide selective disclosure. So I'm allowed to tell one market maker what's in my ETF, which wouldn't be allowed here. So there are regional differences or country differences when you look, and the global industry today has 6,484 different products. The level of assets right now is at 3.4 trillion. And if we look globally today, there's 285 firms that offer ETFs. For the first 10 years that ETFs existed, they only provided exposure to different equity benchmarks. And if we look at in the middle, you can see that 74% of the assets are still sitting within equity benchmarks. And if you look at fixed income, it accounts for about 17.6%, commodities is about five, then you see leverage, you see active is still 1.2, so very small, because today, and I'm gonna show you a slide a little later, I just have a few, um, we really see that most active asset managers here in the US have filed to do non-transparent active, but they do not want to provide that daily transparency. I don't wanna give away my secret sauce of what stocks I own, to everyone else. And it's not just ETF people who buy ETFs. I wouldn't want my competitors to know what I'm buying because they might be able to improve their performance or copy me. 
So secret sauce is really one of the main reasons we don't see that happening in active. This year, if we looked at the net flows through the end of August, we've seen that the industry has gathered $221 billion of net new assets. So I'm talking about creations versus redemptions. We're slightly behind this point of last year. We were at $229 billion of net new. And when you look, the majority of money this year has gone into fixed income, um, which is a record level, and we're right now at $92 billion of net new. Um, equity products are at $71 billion of net new. Commodities are at 34, so another record. And when we look at where the money's going, ETFs are a very good barometer of investor sentiment. So I mentioned I've lived in the UK for 21 years. Brexit was a big driver, not in the beginning of the year, because in the beginning of the year, people here were concerned about what the Fed was going to do, and people in Europe actually were positive because the ACB had announced they were going to continue quantitative easing. But what we then saw is as the vote became closer and closer, people were pulling significant money out of equities and especially out of European-focused equities. To me, today, Brexit is still a huge issue for many investors because we have no idea what Brexit means. Theresa May keeps saying Brexit means Brexit, but nobody knows what that means. And it can have a big impact because in Europe, funds are domiciled in certain countries. Right now, they all rely on the USITS passporting scheme to be able to passport from the UK to Europe or Europe into the UK. What you find is that is all now up in the air. So we're not sure what is going to happen in terms of the ability for financial products to continue to be marketed and sold in other places. One of the issues that um, has concerned me for a long time, and we've always broken out what is an ETF and what is not an ETF. And the reason it was touched on a little bit is there is a significant difference in counterparty, there's a significant difference in tax and in regulations. And especially if you go out to Asia, people do not like it if they buy something thinking it's an ETF and then they get a K-1 form. Because if I'm a private bank, I have to now tell you who all my clients are. I'm going to get in trouble. So people really want to know what is the structure. So a year ago, August, with um, Kathleen Moriarty, we submitted a paper to the SEC's consultation saying it would be very beneficial if there was an agreement as to the specific classification and clarity as to what the products are. Because right now, you find a lot of people call everything ETFs. All they call them ETPs. But what's inside that bucket can be really different. So I told you we have 6,484 products that we count as being ETFs or ETPs in total. If you looked at Bloomberg, their number now is over 7,000. Um, so they're counting a lot of products where there's quarterly creation redemption. You can only buy the product from one firm. And a related issue is many of the issuers of notes, ETNs, have decided they really don't want to have them any longer. So Citi, Morgan Stanley, and Goldman have decided to no longer do creations. I am surprised that the exchanges don't move these into some other bucket and say they're no longer ETNs because they're not doing that creation redemption. So you can have dislocation in the pricing, which I also think is a significant issue that should be clearer. If we look at the assets, <coughs> excuse me, let me just see if I have my water. Um, if we look at the assets, what you find is most of the assets are sitting in fund structures, so highly regulated. And one of the things that surprised me is ETFs have always been very transparent. And so they tell you what's inside and they tell you what they're doing. And many people have been concerned about the use of securities lending. But most funds and collective investment schemes do securities lending. But because they don't talk about it, most people haven't noticed that. So when people get really concerned about securities lending or other things ETFs do, I think there should be greater transparency that most other similar products are doing the same thing. If we could go to the next slide. So my other area of concern, which is significant, would be about what is smart beta? Clearly a great marketing and sales job. Um, you know, if I told you I have a smart beta product, you must think it's better than something that's not smart, like market cap. But the challenge is there's no agreement as to what it is. 
So some people would say that if you take a market cap ETF and you put a currency hedge on it, that's now smart beta. Well, I wouldn't agree with that. The other challenge is, you know, you talk about dividends or yield. So some of the index providers say that's smart and some say it's not. And so you can then go down the list and say, you know, globally, there would probably be, if you spoke to all the different firms that have looked at factors, there's thousands of factors you can choose from. But there's really probably five that most would agree have risk premia that will deliver over long time periods better returns in market cap. But the other big flaw in what happens in this definition of smart beta is, I think many investors think that you're gonna get better returns every day, every week, and every month. And the journalists often encourage that expectation by saying these smart beta products last month or next quarter didn't do better than the market cap. We do see that regulators are looking at this as an area of concern. And um, if we look at the reality in terms of where the assets are today, most smart beta products are in the equity space. So right now, about 1.8 trillion of equity ETFs are in the market cap bucket. So size represents assets. Uh, smart beta is about 550. Other is about 110. So you might say, well, I thought everything that wasn't market cap is smart. Well, that's not true because most would not say price or thematic would be smart. So I think we also have that view that everyone just say anything that's not market cap fits into this other bucket. And then we have active, which you can see is quite small. So I think that's another thing that in our paper to the SEC, we said it would be useful to have clarity in terms of what is smart beta and to have clarity around what are the different factors. I think the other big thing we find is many of the investors besides dividends or yield, which is the biggest category, and people aren't buying it because it's smart, they want income. So they're saying, I want income, I'll buy this. When you move to the other factors, most investors don't really feel comfortable to know when they should use it and how much within their entire portfolio context. And so now what you're seeing is many multi-factor products coming out. Many firms in the US are taking the way they've run money, turning it into a strategy index, then launching an ETF on it. So it's becoming very confusing, I think, for investors to understand how to use the single factors these strategy indices and multi-factors. So I do think that this is an area where there could be significant improvement on a description of what it is and how it works. Because the other big thing we do find is when you speak to people at Morningstar or other places, they would say, well, all of these things are active. So some people say it's index and some say it's active. So I think it's an active decision to use it, but it is all based on rules that people are following to um, generate the income and to run the strategy. So it's not someone fundamentally picking individual securities. If we move to the next slide, I'd like to talk a little bit about what's happening in the active space. So the first active ETF to come to market was in 2008 here in the US and it's actually really difficult to see anyone. But does anyone know which ETF that was? Yes, exactly, so someone knows. So Bear Stearns, why, why, why? And most people, when that came to market, is why? Like, ETFs are all indexed. Why do we need active? Um, I do think that there is a bit of a challenge also in addition to can active funds deliver alpha? The other big challenge is when people go and look at investing in active, they typically would like to have three years of track record and $100 million. So if you launch a new active product, how is that actually gonna sit in the market for three years to get seasoned? How's it gonna get 100 million and who's actually gonna buy it? Because if I go back to when I first started, most of the investors in Europe would say to me, are you gonna pay me rebates? So they wanted to be paid to use products and ETFs don't do that. And other people would say, well, I'm an active manager. This is like fees on fees. I'm not gonna use these things. So I think the challenge is if active ETFs, non-transparent get approved in the US, the challenge is gonna be, how do you get the track record? How do you get $100 million? You could say, well, they could do a share class model. The ability to do that would be, you'd have to go to Vanguard, who has a patent on the share class model here in the US that expires in 2022. So you'd have to go to them and ask, could you use the share class model and patent the process that they have? Or you could look at asking the SEC to allow you to convert an existing fund into an ETF. So 
Today in the U.S., no one has done that. Um, historically, we did see, and actually Dan, I'm not sure if he's in the room, worked at Credit Suisse for a while before he moved here to the U.S. So Credit Suisse in Europe, when they launched their ETF product, they took an SMI, so a local Swiss benchmark index fund, and they converted it into an ETF, which gave them assets and allowed them to launch their product, which they then sold to BlackRock. So when we look at where we are today in terms of assets and products, you can see on the far side that the majority of products are fixed income. And most of the assets are actually, you heard earlier, about bond. So PIMCO has bond and mint, and there's a wisdom tree ETF. Those are where the majority of the assets are sitting. Um, there are some active products, but to be successful as active, you need a portfolio manager, you need performance, and you need a global brand that people know and understand. And so the other big challenge is, as many of these firms look to enter the ETF industry, is how do you compensate your sales force to sell ETFs where you don't know who's buying them and you're paying them more typically to sell active products? So I think that's been another issue that we've seen when people look at the space. So when we look at the next slide, please. We dig through regulatory filings and mutual fund holdings. So Thomson Reuters Lipper collects regulatory filings from 70 jurisdictions around the world, and they data enter what mutual funds globally hold. So going back to 97, globally, only 154 firms around the world held any type of ETF. When we went out to the end of last year, the number had grown to 4,147. Those institutions held 58% of the assets of U.S. listed ETFs at the end of last year. And the institutions that own U.S. listed ETFs are in 41 countries around the world. So as Dan mentioned earlier, just because products sit here and the assets are here in the U.S. does not mean the investors are here. And if you look at the type of investors that own ETFs in the U.S., it'll be sovereign wealth funds, it'll be hedge funds, and if you look at the number of ETFs being held, you would see that of that over 4,000 institutions, 8% of them own over 1,000 ETFs. So you even have a hedge fund that owns over 1,000. Um, so the, what you find in general is, typically people will finally eventually try to use ETFs, and until they do, they usually call them EFTs. Um, so the first time they use them, they'll try them. They'll do a small trade, and what you tend to find is after that, they will use them in more ways, they'll hold them for longer time horizons, and they'll invest more money. So the way people usually will start using ETFs is they'll use them to equitize cash. And what we have seen, kind of was mentioned a bit here earlier, is as regulations have caused the cost of balance sheet to go up and other regulatory costs, many of the futures are now more expensive to use unless you want leverage than using ETFs. So we've seen many investors are using ETFs instead of futures to equitize cash. Many investors, about 47%, are holding ETFs for more than two years. Many use them in core satellite. And we've also seen this big evolution of investors who are using ETFs as a way they deliver returns to their clients. So some people call them ETF strategists, some call them um, ETF managed portfolios. That has been a relatively fast growing product of the business here in the US until one of them actually was misstating their uh, performance data and had some issues. And some of them haven't really delivered the returns that people had hoped. But the other place where we're seeing significant growth in the use of ETFs is robos. So most robos, except in Canada, only are using ETFs and typically are only using market cap products. It's easier to model, and they're always looking for lower cost products. So in these numbers, when I talk about institutions, the SEC's definition of an institution is an entity that manages over 100 million. And so that captures many of the registered investment advisors. So Betterment, Wealthfront will fit into that bucket because they're managing more of that. Um, the other thing we'll see is that 90% of institutions are using equity products and about 52% are using commodity and fixed income. And today, globally, there's 7,211 mutual funds that are using ETFs, and they're in 52 different countries around the world. So ETFs are a global phenomena. In many cases, the regulators in countries outside the U.S. 
have encouraged their local pension funds to use the US listed ETF. So Chile, Peru, Colombia, Mexico have historically been encouraging their local pension funds for non-local exposure to use ETFs. And so that has been an interesting phenomena. The reality, though, is for investors who pay tax, and I don't give tax advice, but US listed products and mutual funds are not very tax efficient. Let's say I wanted to invest in Japan, so I buy an ETF listed here. That ETF will have the tax treaty between the US and Japan withholding inside the fund. All mutual funds and all ETFs have to pay out income at least once a year. So when income is paid out, US withholding is 30%. If you file W8 Ben form, you can probably reclaim about 15%. If you buy a USITS funds, one of the European products, you'll either typically have the Irish or Luxembourg tax treaty to the underlying. USITS funds can reinvest. They don't have to pay out. But if they do pay out, there's no further withholding. So for most investors, a USITS ETF is actually a better product than buying something in the US. The other thing you find is because of regulatory changes in Europe, US products no longer can be sold in Europe by private placement. So they all are now deemed to be alternative investment funds, which means if you want to market and sell them in Europe, you have to register them for sale in each country, each ETF. You have to make filings. And that's a very expensive proposition. So that's why we've seen many of the U US um, providers of ETFs have come to Europe, decided which of their products are being held by a lot of Europeans, and created USITS equivalents that they are now listing in Europe. When we look at Europe, unlike the US under MIFID, which was mentioned a couple times, ETF trades do not have to be reported on exchange. So 70% of the trades are done on an OTC basis, and most ETFs are listed on more than five exchanges. We have 21 different countries that have exchanges where ETFs are listed in Europe. And so what ends up happening is, if someone trades an ETF on the London Stock Exchange, it's going to settle in Crest. If they then wanted to sell that same ETF on, say, um, Euronex, it would have to move to another CSD to settle. So Europe is very expensive. Many of the market makers would say they probably spend about a third of their time repositioning securities from one CSD to another. Um, so the US does benefit from unlisted pr trading privileges and from about 30% of the trades every day you can see that have been done on exchange and very actively traded here in the US. So when we go to my last slide is um, the providers. So when we look at the providers, iShares, State Street, and Vanguard have typically, on a global basis, captured about 70% of the assets for as long as I've been talking about ETFs. So their market share has continued to stay pretty much the same. Clearly, their assets have grown very significantly. But what we do see today of the 285 firms around the world that have ETFs, it's very much a global phenomenon. So if you look down the list, you know, you can see PowerShares Dan's firms up there next, then Deutsche Bank, Nomura, which only has products in Asia, uh, Lixor is Sockgen, um, Wisdom Tree is next. One of the things we've seen in the past couple years as firms look at how do I grow my business and get economies of scale is many firms are partnering with other firms because they don't want to launch their own business or they don't have products in other markets. So if you look, State Street has partnered with Blackstone. They partnered with Mass Financial. They partnered with DoubleLine. If you look at um, DBX trackers, many of the um, Chinese subsidiaries of asset managers that are in Hong Kong want to bring A-share products to Europe and the US. Most have partnered with other firms. So Deutsche Bank has partnered with Harvest. Um, if you look at Wisdom Tree, they have partnered with Beta Shares in Australia to have them sell their products in Australia. So we see various partnering opportunities going around. So many of the firms are looking at, should I partner? Should I acquire? And clearly here in the US, because of the exemptive relief and needing to get talent, acquisition has been a big thing. The other thing we've seen is that uh, new firms are coming to market. So as new firms think about launching ETFs here in the US especially, they don't want to compete in the US only. iShares, State Street, and Vanguard account for 81% of all the assets here. 
And so firms entering the business don't want to compete in that space. So most firms that are coming into the US market today are coming in offering smart beta products. They feel they can charge higher fees. They feel that it's more active. Um, the higher fee model, though, got blown a bit out of the water when Goldman Sachs decided to come out with nine basis points, so much lower than many people had thought. So we do see a lot of fee pressure. And when we think about fees, one thing that's important to remember is when people talk about Vanguard being the low cost provider, every month we do a survey or study where we look at what is the asset weighted fees on average overall and by asset class for the providers. Charles Schwab is the firm that is competing based on being low cost. Vanguard adjusts their fees based on the fact that the company is a mutual company. If the assets go up, they will lower their fees. If the assets come down, they will go up. So they're not sitting there saying, the other day, BlackRock lowered fees. Vanguard is not going to go say, well, BlackRock did this, I'm going to lower. They're only doing it based on movement in assets, where if you look the next day, Charles Schwab lowered fees. So Charles Schwab is trying to gather assets based on offering zero commission. It's very expensive to get someone to open a new brokerage account. So they've used ETFs as a way to win clients. And they make most of their money, if you look at their statements, off of cash management and not off of trading. So it's interesting to watch. And so I would say that, as Dan mentioned, although I've been saying it for a while, 10,000 people in the US turn 65 every day. Most of them are trying to then figure out, what do I do longer term with my money? So they're using robos to do their homework. But most are just getting themselves informed, and they want the hybrid model. So they want to be able to call someone and ask, where should I put my money? What should I be doing? So I think robos are useful to do homework. I think people with smaller amounts of money will continue to use them. But I think those that have more money want the assurance and the ability to ask the question. So clearly, Vanguard has seen significant growth in their offering in that space, as has Charles Schwab. So I think when you think about what are people doing to grow assets, you can become an assembler where you use ETFs, and that would include robos. And clearly, we've seen BlackRock bought Future Advisor. Um, PowerShares is, has bought Gemstone. So the movement to creating or acquiring robos is another big trend that we see happening. So the ETF industry, I believe, especially in the US, will continue to thrive because ETFs relative to other products, there is a significant advantage um, beyond just that they're simple and cost efficient. ETFs are more tax efficient because of the in-kind creation redemption than using mutual funds. And so the act of listing on exchange also gives you new distribution and will lower some costs. So the ETF industry, to me, has been very interesting to watch. I think that we're going to see many new products come to market. Um, and many new exchanges are looking at how do they get involved, and often looking here to the US to see what's happening. But it is interesting to watch the regional differences in how products are created. So in Europe, you can have what was called synthetic ETF. So when you looked at what Deutsche Bank used to do, they would be holding a swap, because you were allowed to do this, to deliver the index return. They would hold some securities to comply with the diversification guidelines. And Deutsche Bank would be the authorized participant. They would be the swap counterparty and the market maker. So in the US, you cannot do that because you can't trade with an affiliated entity. When you think about securities lending in Europe, the guidelines is you can lend, um, but only the cost of covering the lending program can be paid to the manager if they're running the program. Whereas here in the US, there's a cap on how much you can lend, but there is nothing that says the money should be paid back to the fund. So there's many differences that, to me, don't make a lot of sense, that there should be consistency on many of these things, because you often find that people don't understand why same firms have very different things that they do in the way they run their ETFs in different markets. So it's actually a huge challenge. You could talk for days on the differences. But I do think that ETFs are an unusually democratic product, and that it's the only product I know of where end retail, financial advisors, and sophisticated investors get access to the same toolbox of products at the same annual cost with the same very low cost base to be paid.
So I think if you look at ETFs, that has been one of the appeals, I think, for retail investors and financial advisors to be able to have access to the same things that uh, institutions have. I, I can continue talking, but I think that might be a good place to um, see if there's any questions. Can't really tell if anyone's standing or if anyone would like to. Yes. Oh, yeah. Thanks. So my quick question is, there's also very active lending market on the ETF. Uh, this kind of the main players, iShare, Vanguard, Spider, uh, they are also the lenders in the security lending market. What is the motivation why people want to lend out ETF? So that's actually a great question. So when you think about securities lending with ETFs, there's two types of lending. One is lending securities in the ETF. And that's where I was saying some of the providers of ETFs will keep that income for themselves or give a little bit back to the fund. Others give all of it back. Um, so there's different models of what happens. So one is inside the fund, and the other is if I own ETFs and if I lend securities, I can lend the ETF. And the reason to do that is at times, especially in emerging market ETFs, you can earn more income lending it out than the annual cost. So you can think about it that you're almost getting free exposure to that emerging market or potential benchmark based on getting lending revenue paid to you for lending your ETF shares. So securities lending is a way to earn income to offset some of the cost of investing. I see. Uh, related question. So in the secure lending market, ETF has abnormally high fee compared with underlying corporate bond equities. What's the reason why so many people want to pay such a high fee, like a few hundred basis point to, to borrow a particular ETF? Well, I think you have to be careful. So certain ETFs like SPY, there's a lot of inventory and it costs you nothing. So when you talk about securities lending, you have what's called GC or general collateral and those are securities and ETFs that are very easy to locate borrows. Often with ETFs, because there's often not a lot of inventory to be borrowed, and I think often that's because many of the custodians have had relationships with investors for a long time. They didn't ask them, would you lend your ETFs? So often ETFs don't get put into the lending pool. So it's often difficult to locate borrows for ETFs. So the way to get around that is you can do a create to lend, but that's expensive. So it really comes down to, is it easy to find the borrow? If it's not, then you have to pay someone to go out and create it and create that inventory. So it's really not all ETFs are expensive, but you're right that some are more expensive. But it's true with shares, right? When everyone wants to go short a share, you'll find that it's now hot and more expensive than general collateral. Thanks. Yeah, can I add some color for that, please? Sure. Uh, thank you. And plus also ETFs have an annual cost, which you don't have when you buy or hold a share or a bond. So that would be another difference. Yes? I've got a, uh, I've got a related question. Uh, you'll notice that the ETFs often have much higher rates of settlement failures than traditional cash equities. And this involves uh, not just the obscure ones, but also some of the more common ones that, uh, <clears throat> you know, so the combination of settlement failures the combination of extraordinarily high borrowing costs, sometimes hundreds of basis points, clearly hurts the liquidity of these products, hurts the utility of the products. It hurts the issuers who are being deprived of the asset fees when there are failures to deliver. Um, this clearly indicates a lot of frictions in the market for ETFs. 
what can be done to reduce these settlement failures, what can be done to reduce these frictions to uh, basically bring down the borrowing costs? So I think in terms of settlement, what we've seen in Europe is many of the exchanges have instituted pretty high buy-in. So if you fail, you're going to be penalized. And brokers don't want to be penalized, so they are making sure that they don't fail on ETF trades. So they're putting in place people who make sure that the inventory is there, the ETF is positioned properly, and it settles. So I think exchanges or regulators can do something to make sure that it happens. Um, in terms of changing the high fees for ETFs, I think if more of the inventory was in lending pools, it would be easier to locate borrows. So I do think it's a bit incumbent on the larger custodians, and I don't know if uh, Joe is still in the room, but you know, BMY Mellon, State Street on the custody side, et cetera, really should go back out to their clients who use them and ask them specifically, would you lend your ETFs and help them understand what is the benefit? Because I think quite often people get confused by the fact they think there's only lending inside the ETF and they don't realize they can lend ETFs, something you can't do with normal funds. So I think it comes down to education um, because I do think there is, and that would also help on the settlement side, right? Because if I could locate a borrow, I could facilitate settling on time. So I think it is kind of a vicious circle that those two things are inherently linked. And so in Europe, um, I'm the chairperson of a group that Euroclear has put together. So they've come up with a new version of an ETF, which is called an international security version of an ETF. So instead of settling in Crest, it will settle in Euroclear Bank, and they have connections to different exchanges. So you don't have to reposition the ETF from one CSD to another. So I think people are trying to make changes to improve settlement, to improve trading. The challenge is if only a few ETFs end up being in this structure, then you have to make sure people know which ones have to be moved and how to do it. So change is happening, but people are pretty reluctant to change, and that's part of the challenge. Yes. Hey, hey, Jeff, oh. Just one thing to add to that. Oh, he is here. And, um, I don't know where you are, but I hear you. You know, back to the specials question, which you're talking about, there's also a pretty significant demand for term borrow. And unfortunately, with the, with the low interest rates, and there's a balance sheet cost to any firm like ourselves who create ETFs on a principal basis, until the interest rates go up, it's really not economic to, for many of the more popular but longer term ETFs, it would be much lower cost to lend to create them. So I think you see, you know, 20, all the banks are praying for 25 basis point increase as soon as possible. But as we start to see the rates go up, you'll start to see greater supply because they'll be incented to use their balance sheet to, to fill in some of those gaps in the market. You are right, Deb, about there are now, uh, you've shown that institutions who now have used uh, ETFs for much more than just short-term cash acquisition. Many of them have yet to kind of turn the switch on around lending their uh, um, underlying ETF holdings. Uh, but it is, it is growing. I think the view is, is that the ecosystem, uh, back to the liquidity point, we saw the futures in ETFs, if we can provide supply uh, in terms of the borrow market, that it will feed upon itself and, and uh, you know, create a, a tighter environment for everyone. So Joe's with Bank of New York Mellon. So and actually a related point is, you know, I showed you there's 6,484 ETFs. Less than, slightly less than 500 have assets over a billion dollars. And those ETFs account for 81% of all the assets. So we have a lot of tiny ETFs globally. And so the challenge is if I want to buy or borrow, I should say, 10 million of some benchmark exposure, often I'm having to go to multiple ETFs to locate enough borrows and then you have the challenge, do you get recalled on some portion of the loan? Um, so it is a challenge, but it's something that, I mean, I spent 11 years working at Morgan Stanley, so we tried to facilitate doing that. Um, and then I worked, I should say, for uh, just over three years at uh, BGI, which became BlackRock, and I've had my own company now for five years. So um, watching the industry globally, trying to adjust to what people want. Hey, Dan, maybe one last thing. There's now uh, another provider of the market uh, has created a benchmark that includes a series of ETFs, larger ones, highly liquid, et cetera, where many of the uh, firms are pointing to that, to that benchmark as eligible collateral. So the other, the flip side of this is not just on the borrow side, but ETFs to be used as collateral. So it's still, it's still relatively early days, but I'm sure you'll see much greater adoption both in the lending space and the ETFs as well. Yeah, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I'll, oh, I'll ask a quick question. Sure. You've talked about the upcoming 
non-transparent active ETFs. Um, there's been some competition. A couple of proposals have been denied. Some have made it through the advanced next shares model. Um, I'm wondering if you are hearing anything in terms of the actual demand for these products. If you think once they come, will there be investors, either, either institutional or retail best investors, looking to buy these products? So I think the answer to that is very much dependent on who decides to launch which ETF, uh, well, which ETFs at that point, and um, what are the fees, right? So, you know, clearly when PIMCO came out with Bond and Mint, they are active, but they were happy to be transparent. They were hugely successful. Bill Gross was doing really well. People wanted exposure. It made it easy. Um, so it really will come down to, I believe, who offers the product, how they bring it to market. Um, the other thing that's been interesting to watch is in Canada, um, Invesco asked the question of, how can I sell active mutual funds like I sell ETFs to financial advisors? And they've come up with something called platform traded funds. And so active mutual funds get tickers. The financial advisor uses the same order management system. I can put in an order for a share. I can put in orders for ETFs and I can put in orders for active funds. The active funds don't trade on exchange, but they go through the exchange. They get the 630 close. And this, I think, and I told Equitas, which launched the first platform traded fund a few months ago, and Toronto has now come out with what they call Navex. My view is the way people use ETFs today is they don't care about intraday trading. If I'm a financial advisor, I'm using ETFs as a fund, so I want to be able to buy and sell ETFs at NAV, and that's something we've seen for a long time. I don't want spread. I don't want to pay commission if I can avoid it. So I believe that platform-traded fund concept, if you could do a share class of ETFs that weren't traded on exchange but gave you the NAV, could be very popular. Um, but I already have mentioned how here in the U.S., Vanguard has the patented share class model. Today, so I wrote about this a few months ago before they came to market, I was in Canada a month ago and met with the head of um, Equitas and also senior people at Toronto. When I wrote the article, they poo-pooed the idea that it had anything to do with ETFs and it was only for active funds. Now they're being asked and told by investors they would like to see share classes of ETFs where they could get the NAV and not trade on exchange. So I think we're continuing to see, I mean, Canada, doesn't get credit, but they've actually been innovative on many things that they've done around ETFs. And I do think that there's many interesting things. I mean, I could talk about things happening in Japan and China and other places. Over the years, I've been to 58 countries. Um, in Saudi Arabia, they have T plus zero settlement. It doesn't work well, so they're moving away from it. So T plus zero is not the solution because it requires you have a bank account in Saudi Arabia, which most people can't. And so you're seeing that many things if you look around the world, other people have tried most things, and you can learn from what's worked or not worked. I'm glad you mentioned the shortening settlement cycles. Uh, do you think the move to T plus 2 in the United States will uh, uh, make the settlement failure problem worse in ETFs? <laughs> well, I think probably something should be done to have buy-in rules that encourage people to figure out how to get it right. Um, so I think that they probably should go hand in hand. I think just moving it to faster settlement probably will cause the rates to go up. If you don't also do, I think, something to penalize people if they don't make sure this trade settle. Please join me in thanking I'm sorry, I disappeared. Hi, I'm Rohan Williamson. I'm the current dean here at the McDonough School. Um, so uh, on the behalf of Georgetown McDonough School of Business, um, uh, I wanted to thank each and every one of you for attending our, our session today on financial markets uh, uh, quality. Um, and uh, most importantly, I want to thank all the speakers and the moderators, and in particular, uh, the organizers, which is the, the Financial Times and our own Georgetown Center for um, Financial Markets and Policy, in particular, led by Rena Agarwal, John Jacobs, and, and, and the whole staff. Um, and the financial uh, uh, markets, uh, 
Financial Markets and Policy Center, uh, we, they provide a lot of innovative and influential thought leadership on all the critical issues that are related to the global financial markets, which is one of those things uh, that we, we take pride in here at Georgetown. And so, again, I want to thank them for a wonderful conference. And, and it's just grown so much over the years. We were just discussing uh, which number in this we couldn't remember. So I'll go with um, what Jermaine just said. We've done a lot. Okay, so um, again, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Debbie for a wonderful speech, uh, all you guys for attending today, and just a wonderful conference, and we look forward to having you back here in the future as we continue uh, to make our impact in this area. And I just wanted to point out again that immediately following, we're going to have a reception right out here in the lobby so we can continue to discuss a lot of these important issues um, and, and, and kind of learn more about the financial markets, okay? Thank you very much for co coming today and thank all those organizers and presenters. Thank you very much.